Thank you, Mariel, and thank you very much to the organizers to give me the possibility to talk in this beautiful meeting. Uh, first of all, a little warning about these vortex knots. Vortex knots, the talk, the main results are, uh, can be, um, uh, let's say, uh, seen, useful for, for uh, a number of uh, uh, physical systems and not necessarily vortex knots. So don't focus on vortex knots and think of whatever physical system you like. So polymers would do uh, probably well as well. Uh, anyway, to keep things focused uh, and to give you ideas about my work, I prepared the first few slides as a recap of uh, 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 some uh, 20 years of work. Uh, just to uh, consider a particular physical system, I will dual on vortex knots. And the objectives are uh, um, to determine relationships between the structural complexity of physical knots and energy, and to quantify energy or helicity transfers in dynamical systems. Both topics are fundamental in uh, uh, at least uh, trying to tackle this big problem of turbulence that is still an open problem. So uh, vortex uh, tangles uh, might be uh, the skeleton of uh, 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 far more complex systems, but uh, they will uh, allow us to do some analysis in terms of geometry and topology and possibly relationship with energy. Uh, so for, for this, uh, in uh, recent years, uh, I moved to consider uh, to apply the uh, results of knot theory, in particular uh, knot polynomials. And uh, in, uh, on this occasion, I will uh, present you some results about this kind of approach, not polynomial as new invariants of <coughs> physical invariants to quantify topological complexity. And let me stress here to quantify. So we know not, not polynomials are able to, uh, to a certain degree of accuracy to qualify topology. But here I want to stress the idea of quantifying, adding, attaching numbers and possibly estimates for physical quantities. And then uh, something that I will uh, uh, pursue in the future years uh, is uh, to extend and apply new topological techniques to study complex systems. In particular, um, I have in mind uh, uh, homological theories, uh, uh, but uh, it won't be the topic of this, of this talk anyway. Uh, okay, so my, uh, my reference tangle is a vortex tangle, and uh, I will keep this in mind for the rest of my talk. Uh, I want just to give you a brief idea that uh, uh, this approach uh, e using topological methods to study complex systems in fluid mechanics uh, has a long history and uh, uh, in recent years, you know, this dates back at least 20 plus years. Actually, I'm, I'm quite happy to see in the audience the people who, who taught me non theory, Dewitt Sumners and Ken Millett back in Santa Barbara's time. We're going back 25 years or more. And uh, um, it is in the last uh, more or less 25 years that I've been pursuing this. Uh, of course, in recent uh, decades, we had a very high resolution of uh, direct numerical simulations of Navier-Stokes equations, so the, the most real uh, fluid dynamical uh, description you may have. And uh, uh, this allows us to pick up anything that we like, like a pressure, density, vorticity, or whatever, magnetic fields, if we have magnetic fields, and to a high degree of resolution to control, the, to understand and follow the dynamics and control the processes to a certain degree, understand the processes. Even uh, uh, easier, in a sense, would be to uh, consider the skeleton of the vorticities, uh, but this is hard to determine uh, in, a, in a precise way uh, in classical fluid mechanics. However, it's easier in a superfluid helium where uh, the uh, vorticity is so highly localized, there is no diffusion at all. And so the vorticity is highly localized on basically defect lines in the, in the ambient space. And uh, this also um, has uh, benefited a great deal uh, in, uh, in uh, doing numerical simulations to a very uh, good degree of accuracy that are reliable and consistent with experiments. So what I'll do, for simplicity, I will stick to this last uh, 
model. So superfluidity, superfluid vortices as defect lines in a, in a, in a fluid that is otherwise uh, uh, irrotational and uh, kind of perfect. So in this very simple approach, uh, I remind you the approach is extremely simplified in this context. I will take homogeneous, incompressible, and inviscid fluid in R3. Uh, there is a velocity field uh, that uh, uh, somehow drives, governs the motion of the particles, uh, and I identify the particles with the position vector x and time t, and I'll use this divergenceless condition for u and u at infinity. Uh, the vortex line is, as I said, is kind of a defect. So for me, vortex line is basically um, a space curve, and I identify the tangent unit vector with vorticity, as simple as that. And the cross-section of this uh, vortex is so small, we're talking Armstrongs, uh, uh, with a length of centimeters, uh, that I take it as a constant. Uh, circulation in uh, quantum fluid is quantized, so even better, we can take uh, the circulation that is constant in ideal fluid mechanics as setting to one, as one, and uh, just disregard that in a sense. I will keep it uh, uh, in uh, formally present here and there just to keep track of it uh, for a number of reasons. So my vortex tangle is just the union uh, of uh, these, uh, uh, say, filaments. And these filaments may form knot, uh, knots and links, and uh, because of uh, vorticity is the curl of u, uh, there is also a kind of uh, unassumed uh, con consideration about the fact that this filament should close on themselves, but uh, not necessarily actually because of a number of reasons, physical reasons. Uh, the kinetic energy, by looking at Lamb's uh, old formula, can be nicely uh, written in terms of double integral over the, um, the filament length, and of course another important quantity is total length. Well, uh, if I, I said the, the first few slides are a kind of recap of the uh, first uh, uh, or the last, I uh, should say, decades uh, in fluid mechanics where topology started to play a role. And this is uh, uh, basically linked to the discovery of one uh, classical now invariance of fluid mechanics that was proven to be a conserved quantity under ideal evolution only in 58, 1958. And this is helicity. Helicity is just the integral of a field times the curl of the field, whatever is the field. In our case, is the velocity and the vortex vorticity integrated over the domain of uh, the vorticity. Now this, uh, in case of very thin filaments, or actually almost space curves uh, with some, uh, some thickness anyway, uh, can be reduced to a line integral, obviously, by working here, where u, mind you, u is just the uh, induced velocity uh, uh, asymptotically close to the vortex uh, on, uh, by the vorticity on the line, on the chi uh, line of the vortex in space. Well, uh, there is a fundamental result due to Keith Moffat 69 that relates helicity to linking numbers, in particular Gauss linking number in his work, and then was extended to include self-linking number. And uh, if uh, uh, we consider a structure present in these uh, filaments, and uh, we do indeed, uh, the linking number is the Gauss linking number, and the SL is the self-linking number, which uh, I remind you, uh, we saw this uh, already many times, is the Caligurian white invariant uh, when you consider uh, for uh, modeling this physical system a ribbon, and you identify your filament with a ribbon, with the axis and the other edge of the ribbon, and then you define the Gauss linking number of these two edges of the ribbon, then you take the limiting form for the width of the ribbon going to zero, then you find this self-linking quantity, and Caligrano proved that this quantity is a topological quantity. So this is a topological quantity, and as we saw, uh, can be decomposed in writhe and twist, and these are also playing an important role in fluid mechanics. Uh, I remind you, as we saw many times, that the writhe <coughs> is uh, <coughs> taking care of the, uh, uh, say, the coiling and some torsional distortion, the coiling of the, of the filament in space, and it depends on the axis 
of the filament, so it's a geometric quantity that depends only on the axis of the filament, and the total twist, the total twist depends uh, on the ribbon, or if you like, the structure of this filament, not only on the axis, and it uh, combines uh, contribution from total torsion plus intrinsic twist. Well, just relying on this information, uh, during the years I proposed a number of experiments to detect complexity. So I show you just in one uh, or a couple of slides uh, uh, a kind of a brief uh, recap of what has been achieved during the years. Of course, um, it's pretty pretentious because I, I, I will focus on uh, work that I've been I was involved in, and so of course is very, very biased, but uh, this is the idea. Uh, we start to consider superfluid uh, tangles uh, back in the, in the 90s, uh, where the software was uh, pretty, pretty good, and then said, okay, let's, uh, with time, provoke this entanglement. So we, we put energy in the system. I will refer to this uh, test case that for me is still uh, a very, a very um, educational uh, example. So we put energy, mind you, we put energy in it, and we provoke this entanglement to a, a point where we start to say, okay, this is a mature tangle. And when it's mature, uh, for us, we are ready to take uh, measures. And what kind of measure we could take? Well, we took the measure we had at the time. So, of course, all these linking numbers and rive and uh, average crossing numbers may be the correct average crossing number, the exact uh, integral definition, or the estimated uh, uh, average crossing number, similarly for the rive, estimated means uh, that uh, we evaluated according to three mutually orthogonal projections, something like that. There is an error bar associated with that. But the, all these measures, you see, they scale almost the same. The jumps in the linkings are due to the fact that, of course, there are reconnections because the system reconnect and evolves is, is a software that uh, simulate or emulate the real, uh, the real evolution of a superfluid tangle. And, of course, there are jumps in the linkings. But all these... Uh, these evolutions of whatever, uh, whatever uh, measure you take are roughly going twice as much uh, faster than the evolution of uh, uh, energy or, or length, total length, which is usually taken as a measure of uh, the evolution of the tangle. So remember, you put in energy to provoke the tangle, so this increases, and we came up with this uh, relationship that uh, was tested in many in many cases afterwards, and uh, of course this is just a, a nice uh, possibility if confirmed analytically and if confirmed in uh, many other situations to say something about energy by considering algebraic complexity of the system. <clears throat> so this has been done and confirmed for system that decay in a turbulence that decay naturally, so energy decay is there, but still uh, you find something like this. So, of course, uh, this is an interesting thing, but uh, there are a number of things that uh, are not so satisfactory. And one is, uh, first of all, that you have helicity functionally depending on linking numbers. And, uh, okay, I put there circulation that just to remind us the structure of this functional dependence. Uh, but the, the functional dependence on linking numbers, we know historically from not theory that that is not so satisfactory. People uh, uh, were looking for other invariants, and so we did. And uh, <coughs> other invariants, mm, okay. But then also there is another big limitation. Limitations that there are systems like well known the Borromean rings and uh, other systems. Even Maxwell noticed that uh, 1867, a private letter to Tate pointed out that uh, this is uh, uh, have a uh, Gauss linking number zero. And so Gauss linking number has a limitation clearly. But even more so for us, for say fluid dynamics or in general classical field theory, because uh, in the uh, uh, end stages of this turbulent evolution where the tangle interacts, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, reconnects and structures are produced, there are lots of small rings produced. And these small rings are traveling out like bullets in a, in a fluid, interacting with other structures, and uh, the, the end result is the scale down of vortex in smaller, smaller scales, till dissipation kills it off. And this idea of uh, uh, moving in the turbulence energy uh, landscape towards uh, a kind of, I'm um, now thinking of dynamical system approach, in a kind of basin of attraction of, of rings, uh, of vortex rings, of small, smaller scales has been with us 
uh, in the last 30 years. Now, if we have so many small rings that are shot off uh, uh, from the bulk of the uh, turbulent uh, uh, region, uh, and we use the, this helicity in terms of linking numbers, we are not doing a great deal uh, in, uh, in detecting these things, because linking is zero there. And unless we can say something about internal linking, then uh, if we rely only on, uh, on the external linkage, uh, helicity would be zero, no matter how many uh, rings we have, two, three, four, etc. So this was, is uh, very unsatisfactory. And so we moved uh, to consider not polynomials. Of course, we benefited from the progress of uh, uh, the uh, of the, of the results in quantum field theory, rely on the Chern-Simons uh, um, applications, uh, uh, interpretation in terms of polynomials. And so the idea is uh, why, uh, why on earth uh, just uh, stick to linking numbers, let's go to not polynomials. And I will focus here, work started to consider Jones polynomial, but uh, I'm now happy to tell you something about the Homfley PT, uh, M for Millet. And uh, uh, Homfley PT allows us to go back work. Uh, to Jones, so we understand also the difference, at least the physical implication maybe of this uh, difference. So the idea is to use Humphrey PT polynomial on a tangle, so that what you do, you are in a computer, so in a computer they have everything, right? All the data are available, so you take uh, from your tangle, you freeze the tangle, you extract a component, from this component you project the component, you analyze the diagram of it, uh, you put the uh, usual crossing signs at, uh, at crossing sites, and then you can uh, uh, implement uh, this Humphrey PT uh, computation. The computation of the polynomial is constructed by using recursively these uh, uh, two skin relations, and now in front of experts, I'm there to give you a crash course, half a slide on how to compute this polynomial and how to interpret this relation that is important. So I'll start with the first one, and the very simple configuration is the unknot unlinked circle, and U1, and you say immediately, well, the Renzo is nothing to compute there, because the polynomial of this quantity is one, indeed is one, so if I deform it continuously into this uh, figure of eight uh, with a positive crossing here, uh, you will say that probably this is one because it's just uh, topologically equivalent to one another, so indeed this polynomial is one. Okay, so I'll take one of these configurations, let's say gamma plus, and uh, I will uh, do the same. I'll try now to apply this second relationship to this quantity. And again, you may say, well, this P is here. P gamma, gamma plus is one. So there's nothing to compute here, correct. And then I go from the positive crossing to the, to the negative crossing. So I switch uh, this crossing, and I go to this side. And uh, this uh, configuration is just the gamma minus, which has a polynomial that is also one. So I plug one here and one there. Then I have to smooth out these crossings into this. And when I smooth out these crossings, what I get is two unlinked circles. OK, so I can use this relationship because the P of the smoothing is the P is the polynomial of two unlinked circles. And I ended up with a different polynomial than one. Uh, by this uh, information, you know, a minus a minus 1 divided by, C, by z, so I have this p of u2. So I can compute polynomials of uh, all knots, and we have these tabulated in knot tables on internet, so you go there, you take your preferred knot, and you have your polynomials. I mean polynomials, so Alexander, Kaufman, uh, Kaufman bracket are polynomial, and of course, Homfley P.T. Jones, and Homfley P.T., and others. Okay, so the result, the main result, is this. <coughs> if uh, we deal with a knot that is a fluid knot, say, but as I said, it's not so important in, uh, in, uh, uh, for this meeting, uh, we take this, uh, this uh, uh, variable, E2 self-linking, E2 self-linking, I properly rescale because I have uh, to take care of the circulation there, uh, satisfies with a plausible statistical hypothesis the skin relation of the Homfley PT polynomial. I will uh, very briefly uh, say something about the proof, but this is uh, the main statement. Okay, so what we have from the main statement as uh, an immediate result is that we can consider this skin relation, and if we consider this skin relation and uh, doing all the, uh, all the algebra there, we uh, can uh, uh, relate uh, 
these two relations uh, with these two variables, A and Z, uh, to A to the twist, and uh, uh, Z uh, through K to the writhe contribution. Twist and writhe of what? Well, I put there a angular bracket, and I refer here, you have to be patient, uh, at the end you will understand very well what I mean. But for the moment, I will refer to, let's say, we would say a gauge field, a reference field. A reference field can be something like this. You do your simulation or your experiment, and you average out the amount of writhe or twist present in the, in the whole system. And you refer to those values, okay? So let's stick to this, uh, to this uh, uh, proposal for the moment. And then to be extra careful, now I can, I can relax easily the, <coughs> the little algebra there because uh, I can see the naivety. But anyway, at the time, to be extra careful, I can put uh, an uncertainty <coughs> fact factor in front of these uh, uh, average values of right and twist of the reference field. Okay, so if I do this, uh, I can relate, as I said, one variable to twist and the other variable to writhe. And uh, this has uh, interesting physical implications because, uh, first of all, I can interpret the skin relations as a generic uh, relationship between uh, twist and writhe. But when I couple these two variables to go to Jones, for instance, as I, we do here, we get to Jones. So we get to the one variable polynomial of Jones, and then we interpret Jones physically as a polynomial for framed systems, for physical systems that have the rise and twist absolutely locked together. All right, so this is a nice way to interpret maybe one polynomial to the other, and maybe to prefer one polynomial to the other, uh, regardless of the topology we want to tackle. Uh, I just a sketch, brief sketch of the proof. I'm afraid this proof, I will show you two proofs of two results, but this proof is long, so I cannot go uh, through that in details. I just give you an idea. The idea is that first we derive the Kaufman bracket uh, for unoriented knots, and then we have, uh, you remember in the, in the statement I said for a plausible statistical hypothesis. And the statistical hypothesis turns out to be also quite interesting. Uh, we didn't discuss that at all, but with discussions with Luke Kaufman and others came out to be quite an interesting problem. So we consider crossings as a virtual crossing in a mathematical sense. There is no physics there. So the crossings is like this, and we decompose the crossing in a left, right, and uh, up, down, uh, uh, situation. Uh, and uh, now we didn't give any preferential uh, weight to these uh, decompositions. We assume that both the compositions are acceptable and they weight the same. But in uh, statistical mechanics, there are certain systems where you can uh, skew your statistics towards one uh, or the other of these, uh, uh, let's say, re uh, labeling of the crossing, and they would maybe give different. Uh, interesting results for appropriate physical models. But for the time being, this, we give this uh, uh, kind of ergodic assumption that is statistically uh, the same. We orient the knot, and then we derive uh, one, uh, the skin relation for Z in terms of the writhe by going from the uh, Kaufman bracket to the R bracket, uh, the R polynomial, and here you have the directional writhe that plays a role and enters in this uh, example, in this uh, equation. Then we noted that uh, at a certain point in the derivation, uh, we have this uh, relationship present, and this is just relating uh, what you see uh, through a pre-factor here. And at the beginning, we didn't pay attention in Jones' case of this pre-factor. Then we gave a little thought about this, and we could interpret, or we offer as an interpretation, this pre-factor in terms of then surgery. So if you, if you plug in the, uh, uh, through then surgery the twist, then you can reinterpret the Rider Master Type 1 move as a, a twist action on the strand. And so this becomes crucial in uh, giving A the uh, relationship with uh, the twist. So you get to this, uh, let's say, to this transformation, E to self linking. Okay, so if you do this, what you get? Well, first of all, is a polynomial, an adapted uh, Humphrey polynomial that now takes into account the physics through uh, the circulation and, of course, takes uh, account of the topology fully in a more complete way than the linking numbers. Uh, 
so let's let's do an example, okay? Because we didn't perform any any computation at the moment. So it's just I'm sorry, it's just a kind of mass talk with a hope with a hope to stir up some interest and uh, plug in this uh, this approach to some some numerical data. Anyway, homogeneous superfluid tangle. Okay, we take gamma one, and then it's a thought experiment. All right. So a thought experiment. Okay, let's let's be simple. Mathematicians are very simple people. So we take an average right, an average twist of a half. You will please bear with me because it is not so essential. But okay, let's take this as a half and then be extra careful and add this other half uh, for the uncertainty of these values. And then you come up with this with these numbers. So these are numbers, right? Okay, so we are numbers because we have numbers. We start to use these numbers to compute the values of these polynomials. So we have the n collection of uh, unlinked unknotted loops that scales like this. Then we have the op, uh, positive op, and negative ops, etc., etc., etc. All these numbers, sorry. All these numbers. First of all, when I saw these numbers, uh, I wasn't that happy uh, for a number of reasons. First of all, this is less than one uh, to the an exponent that is going to uh, be much larger. And uh, so I said, um, it doesn't click with the physical intuition. You would like something that you think is getting more kind of, uh, uh, you know, is interact rings are interacting, and this is, uh, the more rings you have, and this is getting down and down and down. So I wasn't that happy. Plus the, these numbers, you know, there is no relationship. Some, some are, uh, are positive, some negative, you don't see anything there. All right, but then uh, I was uh, very lucky to have uh, do it uh, uh, at one of my talks, and uh, he pointed out the results of uh, Marielle and uh, others, and uh, at the time we had also the results done by, uh, um, by, uh, by uh, the group of uh, William Irvine on uh, vortex uh, filament interactions, as Marielle showed. So I go back to uh, vortex experiments. So we have a vortex trifoil uh, cascade process in, uh, in water. So these are real, as probably Mario said, these are real, uh, real vortices in, in water. And they're very, very thin. This is not superfluid, okay? So it diffuses and dissipates uh, uh, quickly. However, you see, they managed to produce remarkably uh, uh, in the lab a, a trefoil knot. So if you look at the movie, you will see, as if you think of some uh, smoke in the air, that is very evanescent. Uh, Okay, it get destroyed, uh, get destroyed very easily. But anyway, this uh, is visible for some time, slow motion, and then you pay attention to the frames uh, in this evolution. You identify these as the two, three, and then you go on and you see that, uh, for instance, it forms a, a structure that you may call it a torus link, two, two. Okay, so it's topologically torus link. And then you let it go, and here at a certain point, if you follow very carefully this, it goes back here. Yeah. So it's actually a kind of loop, unknotted, unlinked loop to deform the in space. So I will call it the Chu 1, uh, torus Chu 1. And then uh, it keeps going at a certain point. Uh, we are at the later stages of this evolution where the structure dissipates and basically disaggregates in the, in the fluid. So we are at the stage where you may still see two unlinked, unknotted uh, loops. Well, I, 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 I'm afraid that I've been uh, um, uh, very often not so close to uh, lots of people I know they do numerics, so I, I couldn't, uh, uh, I couldn't uh, intrigue them to do numerics, uh, high sophisticated numerics. They're all taken by their grants, etc., etc. But I had a friend close by in Milan uh, who is a, a great expert in Grosbitayevsky equation, and his name is Simone Zucker. And uh, so I asked Simone to use his code to simulate something like this. So, you know, we started uh, from a stage. Uh, uh, at this stage, not here, we aim to go upper in complexity, but for the moment, this is the result. So we started with a uh, simulation of the gross Pitayeski, of sorry, yes, the, this is Bose Einstein condensates, and these Bose Einstein condensates evolves, uh, evolve according to the gross Pitayeski equation. This is a kind of good uh, approximation for superfluid vortices as well. And so um, I asked him if you could uh, spend some time to do this work on 
one following up the evolution of a uplink under the uh, gross pitayevsky equation, and remarkably, he found uh, almost the same situation. So again, you have a stage where the loop is formed, and then again, a stage where uh, there is a reconnection, and the secondary smaller loop form, and because it could follow to a high degree, remember this system is also a real system, uh, but this, in this simulation, the dissipation is very, very low, very low. It's like superfluid, uh, you know, superfluid vortices can stay there for millions of years, for 250 million years. And uh, the only way to let them uh, decay is to increase temperature, you know? From millikelvin, you go to temperature, uh, normal temperature, then they die out immediately because viscosity becomes so important. But uh, in, uh, in under gross pitayevsky equation, these things can evolve still, and so you still have uh, farther reconnections and farther uh, contributions from smaller rings. So you enter in a new family of structures. Can we do anything useful with this Humphrey PT? So, uh, well, we try to set up a kind of mathematical problem, and so you have to be, uh, you know, to simplify things. Uh, first of all, uh, we consider cascade process where only one reconnection at a time of, occurs. Secondly, I confine myself uh, to the topological class uh, you picked, uh, i.e. the torus knots and links. So I stay within that class, and uh, so I assume that uh, uh, going from a torus knot to a link to a knot to a link, etc., only one reconnection takes place. Moreover, I don't even care, of course I do, but I don't even care in this approach uh, if what kind of reconnection is taking place. I'm just assuming there is a reconnection. That's it. I don't know if it is anti-parallel, parallel, parallel etc. So this is the class of uh, torus knots and links I consider, and the assumptions. So all torus knots and links are standardly embedded in a mathematical torus that makes us uh, our analysis uh, simpler in closed brave form. Then I consider all torus knots and links to form an ordered set of elements listed according to the decreasing value of topological complexity. So crossing number is just identifying the topological complexity. And uh, as I said, any topological transition between two contiguous elements is just dictated by a single orientation preserving reconnection event. I pause for a second. I, I, I don't have uh, any reason other than advertising, uh, that uh, we did some work with DeWitt on the conservation of Rife under anti-parallel uh, reconnection. And because I've seen uh, this uh, uh, Rife uh, uh, um, um, evaluated across during reconnection in the talks, for example, Professor Zumer and the other, uh, I think it might, this result might play an interesting role in their, in their analysis, in particular crystals. But anyway, I go back to my slides. So these are the assumptions. I'm not saying that they are anti-parallel or parallel um, uh, reconnecting. So these are the assumptions. So what we do? So we have this result. The adapted uh, Onfleet PT computation of, uh, of, uh, this, uh, of this uh, family generates for decreasing n a monotonically decreasing, sorry, a monotonically, decre oops, a monotonically decreasing sequence of numerical values given by a formula that is a bit awkward to read where these uh, quantities are totally determined, a uh, known function of, if you can read here, twist and rise basically, of given twist and ride with initial conditions prescribed by uh, these two configurations. So the sketch of the proof is this. Um, because you embed your torus uh, family on the standard torus, you can always uh, do a skin relation on, these, uh, on this braid uh, pattern. You localize your, your site, your crossing site, you apply your second skin relation, and you just relax the braid in one form or the other. So you come up with this, you do it recursively, and so there is a little bit of algebra here. And uh, if you follow the algebra at a certain point, you come up with these uh, with these groups of uh, of uh, factors. And in these groups, uh, you can now plug in your information about the the Humphrey PT variables. You plug E to something like Rife, and you plug E to something like uh, Twist. So the formula is this, and you know everything here. All the information is available, supposing, you remember, 
to assume certain rise and twist uh, as an average field or reference field. I come up to that, I come to that in a moment, but uh, okay, so you have the formula, you can compute things, then we start thinking, okay, we considered here, uh, if you paid attention, it was, uh, it was uh, a positive sequence of torus knots and links, what about the others? And so you, in, very interestingly, you pay attention to these, uh, to these algebraic structures, and you see that if you switch to mirror knots, uh, basically uh, you can generalize this formula to positive or negative torus knots and links. Uh, you use this formula to compute numbers, and what you see is this. You compute the number for the trifold, you get uh, 1.5. Five, and then you go to 1.11, and then you go to 1, and then uh, 0.48. So it's decreasing. Now, the other thing is, uh, let's be wild for a moment. I'm not saying that it's justifiable mathematically, but let's be wild and keep going to the different family. And even the different family's capture is still decreasing. That's very interesting. Okay, so next step is uh, kind of obvious. You have a sequence that is monotonically decreasing in values, and it captures this uh, monotonically decreasing complexity. And as uh, all we guess is uh, probably the same for any kind of uh, topological detector. Uh, point is that here we can associate a number. Now we, we dare to refer this to energy, and the referee, one of the referee was pretty tough and said, no, 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 you can talk about, uh, you can speculate about energy in the text, but you have to remove it in the abstract. We didn't say much. We just said that possibly is related to energy. Anyway, I cannot comment on energy other than, of course, it's very interesting. It's very interesting. Other than saying that, for instance, for instance, if you take the curvature energy, what mathematicians like is about knots and links, i.e. the integral of curvature squared, which is in physics means uh, the bending energy, basically. The bending energy for this, uh, for a number of, of torus knots and links, have, uh, for, sorry, for a family of torus knots, for a number of them, is, keeps decreasing with uh, decreasing complexity. I can add, uh, I have the diagram, it's published in 2010, uh, also kinetic energy for vortices decreases consistently with uh, this decrease. I'm not quite sure to say something about magnetic energy, but magnetic energy, let me, let me publicly uh, uh, say something loudly, <laughs> maybe not, uh, not correct, totally correct, but magnetic energy uh, basically scales with uh, geometry because uh, Lorentz forces in the magnetic fields is uh, a great deal of that force is due to curvature to curvature information. And so, like elastic systems have a bending energy that go down, uh, I would expect the bending and the magnetic energy would go down for, uh, for the same reason. So, we don't have, we, we didn't establish a relationship, a mathematical relationship between uh, these two behaviors, but it's clearly there. Now, uh, what about uh, the cascade that we saw in other in other contexts, and of course I mentioned Dewey's interest in this because he triggered my interest in the work of Mariel's work and Mariel's group, and uh, so this is uh, uh, the kind of cartoon we saw from her presentation. Then I was pleased to see from Mark Miller uh, a kind of similar cascade, or, or the other way around, <laughs> the increasing in complexity that resembles this kind of, uh, um, this kind of uh, family cascade. And uh, so I came up just with the last, uh, last minute with this, uh, with this um, idea. Of course, is uh, very much in our minds now. Uh, we don't have computational data to work on, and so I'd be the last one to discover anything useful here. But at least let me end up with this uh, just conjecture. So what would be the optimal path to cascade? Well, optimal with respect to what? Of course, uh, Amariel gave us uh, uh, a clear definition of uh, a cascade, so it would be a topological, in terms of topological complexity. Here, I would uh, be inclined to think of uh, some energy path, some preferential path for energy. But, of course, you are not uh, uh, strictly limited to this particular family of knots. Fluids can do whatever they want. And we may think that the 2-5, instead of going to the 2-4, it might go to this uh, connected sum. Why not? 
So we just started to play with numbers, uh, the little we could do, mind you. And uh, so, uh, we, you know, this is the process, this is the pathway you have if you follow the Humphrey PT analysis as I presented to you. But uh, you may follow an alternative path, why not, where you go to the connected sum of the trifolds and then you go through this. Uh, configuration, and then you end up with the same uh, trifle. Now, if you do this path, uh, you see here that uh, according to our adapted Humphrey PT, we don't have uh, any indication that this would be preferred to this, because even in this case, uh, the numbers are keep decreasing. So I have to stop here, other than saying that, uh, uh, of course, I'm terribly intrigued by the possibility to associate in a, a kind of approach to the Mario uh, proposed a probability um, to each of these paths, and uh, if we have a weight to give to this pro to this uh, path, then we could presumably just purely on a how to say on a, a statistical mechanics uh, uh, abstract approach uh, determine which path is preferential or not. Clearly, there is energy to play a role as well and probably would uh, trigger one part from the other. Well, I stop here. Thank you very much. <laughs>